All right, so this lecture will be topic four, chapter four, the forces of evolution. So this goes along with chapter four in the explorations textbook. And it's also our fourth topic that we're covering this semester. All right, so forces of evolution. Go ahead and get our chapter slide going. Okay, so forces of evolution, we're going to go into essentially diving deeper into what is evolution itself, and then also looking at the forces that influence evolutionary change. So remember, evolution is essentially changes or fluctuations in genotypic frequencies from generation to generation. Okay, and that is something that we will actually be able to mathematically calculate using the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So um, especially if we're looking at microevolution, and especially when we're looking at those Mendelian or genetically simple one gene, one protein traits. We can study evolutionary change in a breeding population over time, over many generations. So remember, it's important to remember that evolution will operate on groups of potentially reproducing organisms or a gene pool, and not necessarily on one individual, not one human or one orangutan or one finch or one pea plant. Um, evolution takes many generations, sometimes thousands sometimes millions of years for any notable visible change to occur. So um, it's important to remember that we have to study groups of interbreeding individuals or a gene pool in order to study evolution. So that's why when you're reading about studies on evolution, sometimes it's on pea plants or bacteria or fruit flies or finches or rock pocket mice. Um, not because humans aren't interesting, humans are fascinating, but simply because Humans live a long time, so it's very difficult to study multiple generations of humans within a scientist's lifetime or even a group of scientists' lifetimes. So that's why oftentimes when we're looking for evidence of evolution, we're looking at organisms that have a relatively short lifespan. Okay, so evolution acts on populations of interbreeding organisms, not on individuals. Um, a dem is referring to members of a species that produce offspring. So essentially the breeding members of a population. So those that have um, reached reproductive maturity and have not hit um, the end of their reproductive lives yet. So those for females between menarche and menopause. Uh, so menarche is the onset of menstruation like we talked about in chapter three. And then menopause would be when, that's, when that ceases, when that ends. Um, so that's referring to a dem, the breeding members of a population. And all of the genetic material, all of the genes within a population are referred to as a gene pool, okay? So in chapter three, we talked about a genome. A genome would be one individual's, one human's, or one orangutan's, or one rocket pocket, rock pocket mouse. It would be just one individual's chromosomes, okay? So if we're talking humans, mapping somebody's genome is looking at all of their base pairs, all of their genes located on all 46 chromosomes, but a gene pool would be everyone in that breeding population. So if everyone here in this classroom today is a, is a breeding population, then it would be all 10 of us multiplied by 46, okay? So all of those genes, all of those chromosomes would constitute a gene pool if we were a hypothetical breeding population. Okay. Oh, excuse me. All right, so some more kind of key concepts and vocab words to get out of the way to make sure we can understand what we're talking about here. So members of the same species, so kind of the qualifiers in order to be a member of the same species, you must be capable of breeding with one another and not just breeding with one another, but you must also be capable of producing both viable and fertile offspring, okay? So that's the important part. So a, for example, a tiger and a lion are fully capable of breeding with one another. And sometimes they're capable of producing one generation of offspring. We call those ligers. I know, super technical term, right? But that liger is generally sterile, meaning that that liger cannot go on and then produce another generation of ligers, okay? So if that first generation is sterile, then that means that those two individuals, that mother and that father that produce that liger are not the same species. There must be a chromosomal or you know, some other internal force that's preventing their offspring from being viable. Okay, now that is um, 
That is also true of horses and donkeys. That's also true of ostriches and emus. That's also true of many different species. Uh, but if a species, if two individuals are capable of interbreeding with one another and producing viable fertile offspring, then they are defined as members of the same species. So that's essentially the biological species concept is that individuals that can interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring are considered to be members of the same biological species. Now we will learn in unit three, there are some, there's some debate about this because there is a lot of evidence that Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis, so modern humans and the, the Neanderthals were in fact producing viable fertile offspring because those of us that have um, European, Western Asian, or Middle Eastern descent, or even just a little bit of it, um, it's been proven that there is Neanderthal haplotypes in our DNA. For example, I have, I think, 283 Neanderthal haplotypes in my DNA. So in order for that to be possible, that means that there was at least a handful of successful interbreeding ev events, right? So if that's happening, then that really calls into question whether or not we could consider Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis separate species. Maybe they were not. Maybe they were just variations of the same biological species. Okay, so species are generally defined also on reproductive isolation. So reproductive isolation is just any mechanism that prevents two populations from interbreeding and exchanging their genetic material. So it could be something geographical. It could be a mountain range or an ocean or... Um, any geographical formation that prevents two segments of a population from interbreeding, from engaging in gene flow. Um, it could be behavioral, like when we talked about the finches, some of the finches um, had certain songs that would identify members of the same species and the, and the males would not even attempt to interbreed with the finches that didn't have the, the song that they liked or the pitch of song that they liked. It could be behavioral isolation or it could be something genetic. It could be that you know, like with the tiger and lion scenario, it could be that they're attempting to interbreed, but they're not successful at producing viable offspring. Okay, so if species are geographically and genetically isolated for a long enough period of time, speciation events can sometimes occur. So a speciation event is those branching events, right? Those branching events I keep talking about when species are going off in different directions, adaptively radiating to fill new roles in the environment. So that's adaptive radiation and that's speciation, which we'll talk a lot about here in this lecture and, and a lot in unit the number three, too, when we talk about the history of human evolution. Okay, so the field of population genetics will study change over time or the lack there of it present in gene pools. Okay, so if we're looking at a group of zebras, for example, a breeding group of zebras, and we know that there are specific genes that influence whether those zebras have stripes or spots. And we can visibly count them. We can visibly count, okay, let's say there's 100 zebras. And let's say that 60 of them are striped and 40 of them are spotted. And we understand the genes that influence stripes versus spots. Then we can actually do a mathematical calculation to determine how many homozygous dominants, how many heterozygotes, and how many homozygous recessives are present in that population. And then we have to do that same thing during generation two, and then the same thing during generation three, then the same thing during generation four, so on and so forth. And this might sound a little bit familiar. It might sound familiar to when we were talking about the scientific method and that repeated hypothesis testing is necessary to come to any, you know, any significant scientific conclusion. So um, this is, you know, a mechanism that we can use to study microevolution, and we will learn how to do it here in this chapter. Probably not today, but probably next week. Do I have questions so far? And I do really encourage you guys to ask questions. I really do. I would love for our Zoom meetings to be more interactive. I would love for you guys to ask questions whenever they come up. I mean, I do understand many of you have stuff going on. You, you know, maybe just listening to the lectures, you're doing something else, and that's okay. Um, as long as you're ready to engage once breakout room time comes. Uh, but I really do encourage you, if, if questions pop up as I'm going through the lecture, I'll try to stop every couple slides and just kind of check in. Um, so yeah, just let me know if questions pop up. Professor. Yes. Does attraction get measured in animals, you know, with these ligers and these, these lions and tigers? Or do they just, an animal? Can you say it one more? 
Could you say it one more time? You were just breaking up a little bit, or maybe type it in the chat box. Just try saying it one more time. So it was just kind of breaking sure. up a little bit. Do lions and tiger do they measure attraction, or you know, because these animals are different, are different. How do they connect? Do do they measure that? So essentially, the the only way that this happens now is in zoos or in uh, wildlife parks, right? Because it, you know tigers live in Asia, lions live in Africa, so they're separated. They have a huge geographic separation. They're separated by large oceans and continents, right? Yeah. Uh, so the only way this happens in modern day is if it's in a zoo setting or a wildlife park, or it happens because of human influence, essentially. So we don't we don't know how to measure attraction, essentially. Um, I mean, I guess we could potentially design some studies, although I don't know if it'd be ethical, like we could design some studies to see, you know, if a group of, we had a group of tigers and lions in the same enclosure, would it be more likely that they would only interbreed with their own species or would they just mix it up? Um, yeah. If I had to guess, if I had to guess, if they were all in the same enclosure, I would say that they probably would mix it up, although I don't know. I mean, that's never a study that's been done for ethical reasons um but it, it, unfortunately we don't know the answer to that question because they're not they're not in the same environment um a yeah. better example might actually be chimpanzees and bonobos um chimpanzees genetically speaking are about 99 percent identical to us and bonobos are as well bonobos and chimpanzees are so closely related in fact that when they were first discovered it was once thought that they were exactly the same species um, they have since separated them. Chimpanzees are pan troglodytes and, and bonobos are pan paniscus is their genus and species name. Um, bonobos tend to be a little bit more built, more gracile, more delicate, longer and lankier. They tend to be a little less hairy. They tend to have um, a little bit more exposure, skin exposure on their face. Uh, they tend to maintain, you know, they tend to be a little bit more uh, female dominated. The females are generally dominant over the males, where in, in chimpanzee society, it's the opposite. Bonobos tend to use sex to negotiate dominance. Um, they tend to be a little bit more peaceful and not as competitive. And I don't want to give too much away because we have a whole chapter that delves into this chapter seven. So I don't want to give too much away. But, um, you know, they have had some successful circumstances of interbreeding. Mm. And, you know, I... So, I mean, that really calls into question whether or not we should call those two separate species. So, and th there's also been some scenarios where they did interbreed, but the offspring were not viable. So it's, you know, they have likely been separated from each other for long enough for there to be some degree of speciation. Uh, but that's why even though something that was once thought to be very black and white, very cut and dry is now a lot more, we're finding out it's a lot more complicated. There's a lot more gray area. So it's, you know, the biological species concept was something that was once really accepted and it still is accepted. It's just, we're, we're starting to realize that there may be some exceptions to the rule, I guess is what I'm saying. Is that making sense? Oh, it does. Thank you so much. Great. You're very welcome. Good question. Other questions? We're feeling good. Okay. All right. So this is just an example here of reproductive isolation. So this map depicts the distribution of two related bird species, Ostriches are found mainly in Africa, naturally speaking at least, whereas emus are found in Australia, obviously separated by, you know, a large amount of ocean, <laughs> a large amount of ocean there. So um, obviously they do not come into contact unless it's unnaturally, unless humans are putting them together. Uh, but we do know that enough time has passed, they share a common ancestry, but enough time has passed that they are genetically distinctive species because they are not capable of producing viable fertile offspring. So just another example, you can see, just looking at that picture, you can see they are um, similar, very similar looking species, just some variations in coloration, uh, but the variations within their genes are um, significant enough that they are separate species. All right, so you've seen this slide before, but this is actually the chapter where we're going to go into this in more detail. So you saw the slide first in chapter two when I introduced just the history of the theory of evolution. Uh, but in this chapter, we're actually going to look at each force in more detail. So this slide just introduces it to you and then we'll talk about each one in more detail. So the first force of evolution is mutation. So it's important to remember mutations are not always bad. In fact, sometimes they're good. Uh, sometimes they introduce variation in the population that is necessary, like the rock pocket mouse example, that MC1R mutation 
introduced the black fur coloration, which allowed the mice to blend in with their environment after the volcanic, volcanic eruption. Okay, so mutation just means any random change in the DNA, and it's the only source of brand new genetic material. Okay, so it's not always bad. It introduces new variation, which as we know in evolution, in the game of, in the game of evolution, diversity always wins. So in fact, mutations are not, not a bad thing. It just means we're introducing new variation into the gene pool. Now, there are some mutations that end up being detrimental or, um, you know, reduce the survivability of a species. Those are, there are some of those too, of course, and we'll talk about those. Uh, but interestingly enough, you know, sometimes those mutations, we find out that they may have existed for a reason. When we talk about the sickle cell trait in relation to malaria, I'll give you an example of that. All right, force number two is natural selection. So that's just essentially the idea that individuals within a population will have, some individuals will have superior traits or better adapted traits in comparison to others in the population, and they will hence survive and reproduce in higher frequencies. Uh, but it's important to remember that it's not necessarily survival of the strongest, the smartest, the uh, the most aggressive, the most attractive, that's not necessarily natural selection. Um, what's beneficial in one environment may not be beneficial in another. Like the rock pocket mouse example, the tan colored mice had the advantage for a period of time and then all of a sudden it shifted. Once the environment shifted, then all of a sudden the dark black mice had the, had the advantage because they blended in with the volcanic eruption. Okay, so it's just important to remember survival of the fittest doesn't necessarily mean survival of the strongest, the most intelligent, the most attractive. That's not necessarily what we're getting at here. Uh, number three is genetic drift, which I'm going to, for now, just say it's any random change in allele frequency. We're going to talk about the two types of genetic drift, the founder effect and the bottleneck effect in more detail, but it'll make more sense once I have the, the images on the slides for you. And then the last one we'll talk about is gene flow. So gene flow is just another way of saying admixture or exchange of genes between population or migration of genes from population A to population B. So this one will probably be our easiest one to understand. It's just simply, you know, if we here in this classroom, if we're all population A, and if we pretend there's a physical classroom next to us that's population B, and then another classroom over here that's population C, it would just mean that all of us are interbreeding, swapping our genes, producing offspring, um, you know, that's all that means. It's just interbreeding and or swapping of genes. All right, let's talk first about mutation. So like I mentioned, mutation is not always a bad thing. It's just the only source, the only random source of new genetic information within a gene pool. Uh, mutations can be any random change in the structure or the amount of genetic material. So remember when we say genetic material, we're simply talking about DNA. We're talking about something we learned about protein synthesis. So there's an example up here. So we've got a we've got a string. We've got a DNA template up here, which is A G A, G T A, C T A, and then G G A. Remember, I'm reading them in threes because those are codons. And then we've got our messenger RNA coming in. So adenine pairing with uracil, guanine pairing with cytosine, adenine pairing with uracil, guanine pairing with cytosine. Thymine pairing with adenine, adenine pairing with uracil, cytosine pairing with guanine. You guys get the point, right? I don't want to read out the whole thing and bore you guys, uh, but you guys get the picture, right? It's the it's a DNA template and then the messenger RNA strand coming in. And then we've got during translation, the ribosomes are going to read that messenger RNA strand codon by codon and then determine what amino acid is being coded for. So that UCU codes for serine. The CAU codes for histidine. The GAU uh, codes for aspartate. And the CCU codes for proline, okay? So now we've got this chain or sequence of amino acids, serine, histidine, aspartate, and proline. Um, but then there's a random deletion, a random mutation that deletes just one of those nitrogen-based pairs, okay? So when just one of them is deleted, remember, it actually impacts the entire genetic code going down the line, okay? Because it's changing those three, right? It's changing the, the three codons. Uh, so the deletion is occurring right here. So an adenine, or excuse me, yeah, an adenine was deleted in the DNA template. Uh, so it affected everything from here on down the line. 
Okay, so the the things that happened before that are not impacted, not impacted. So we still have AGA coding for UCU, which codes for serine still. So you see, there's no impact here, but now there's an impact because that third letter in the in this codon instead of being an adenine is now a cytosine. So now we've got a GTC coding for a CAG, which instead of histidine is now glutotamine. Okay, and then now we've got a CT, excuse me, we've got a TAG coding for an ACU, which instead of aspartate is now isoleucine. Okay, so a deletion, even though it's only one letter being deleted, it's essentially impacting the rest of that genetic code. Okay, so a deletion or an insertion or a frame shift mutation is generally more severe then say a point mutation, okay? A point mutation would just be one letter randomly changing to another. So the point mutation, it's not because it's not deleting or inserting, it's not impacting the remainder of the genetic code. It's only impacting that one codon, that one set of three. All right, so a mutation, just as, as a good definition, is any inheritable change in the genetic material, also known as a DNA which is sometimes a good thing because it's a vital source of new variation within a population. The action of natural selection together with mutation, particularly in small populations, has the potential to change gene frequencies more rapidly. And we'll look at an example of this here in a moment. Uh, mutations can occur during any of the processes that we learned about during chapter three. They can occur during mitosis, meiosis, DNA replication or protein synthesis, okay? Anytime during those processes. So a mutation, any inheritable change in the genetic material or DNA, which is a vital source of new variation within a population. The act of natural selection combined with mutation, particularly in small population sizes, can change gene frequencies more rapidly. So the rock pocket mouse is another great example of that. Remember when they talked about if that MC1R mutation has a provides a 10% advantage and it would still take about 100 years for that to have any major impact on the overall breeding population. But say that MCR1 mutation that codes for the dark black fur, if that has a 60% um, advantage, then it's going to change the frequencies, the gene frequencies far more rapidly. Okay, so it just really depends upon the selective advantage. How much of an advantage does that mutation provide the organism? Okay, and these mutations can occur anytime during mitosis, meiosis, DNA replication, or protein synthesis. Do I have questions so far? We're feeling good. Okay. All right, so this is an example of something called Klinefelter syndrome. So this is actually an entire extra chromosome. So it's not, we're not talking just a segment of the DNA, we're talking an entire extra chromosome here. So we saw some examples of karyotypes in chapter three, uh, but just to review a little bit, a karyotype is just a picture of the chromosomes basically. So this is what they would do uh, when a woman's pregnant, they do what's called an amniocentesis, usually around month five. Uh, they take a little bit of amniotic fluid, they put a big needle in, in the womb and they extract a little bit of amniotic fluid. And back in the lab, they actually organize all of the chromosomes in order like this. Okay, and amniocentesis is also done more frequently in what they call geriatric, geriatric pregnancies. Any pregnancy over the age of 35 is considered geriatric. Um, and that's a, it's a horrible name for it, <laughs> but it just means that if any pregnancy that's a, over the age of 35, if the woman is over the age of 35, there's a higher likelihood of a chromosomal abnormality. Okay. So that's why they definitely do an amniocentesis if the pregnancy is for any reason, high risk. Okay. So, you know, just pretend for a second, this is an amniocentesis of a pregnancy, you know, from a woman. You know, it doesn't even have to be a woman that's over 35. It just means that, you know, this woman had an amniocentesis done, and this is a picture of the chromosomes of her child. So chromosomes number one through 22, we call those autosomes. So you see the positions are labeled here. The first position, those are the largest chromosomes. And then the 22nd position, those are the smallest chromosomes. And then position 23, those are the sex chromosomes. 
So this particular individual has an aberration, an abnormality, a mutation on the sex chromosomes. This individual has two X chromosomes. Remember the X chromosomes are larger and then one Y. So we call this XXY syndrome or Klinefelter's. Uh, so the those with Klinefelter syndrome tend to have um, some cardiac issues. Sometimes they tend to have uh, more development of the breast tissue, uh, but they have you know some of those some with Klinefelter's end up having completely normal, healthy lives, and some of them even reproduce. It just some of them are some are sterile, some are not. Um, but sometimes they end up living completely normal, healthy lives. So you know that's just an example of something that could, could be considered an aberration, a chromosomal aberration. All right, so spontaneous mutations have no known cause. Um, like I mentioned before, I think in this class, there is an up and coming field called epigenetics that's looking at how um, the environment or changes in the environment may actually impact mutation rates. But at least what we know thus far, um, you know, I try to always just teach you information that we have some solid evidence about. And what we know so far is that mutations are spontaneous and have no known cause. Uh, except for the induced mutations that are caused by environmental agents, such as mutagens. Uh, most mutations are actually harmless. So they, there is what we call neutral mutations that have no positive or ne no negative impact. So an example of this, look at this cheetah here. You can see that the majority of the cheetah's fur is that kind of spotted, patched, um, you know, pattern that we're accustomed to. But on his or, back, on his or her back, we see these um, vertical lines. So there is a mutation that's causing just that section of fur to be vertical lines instead of patches. So that cheetah is still just as fast, just as good at catching prey, just as good at finding territory and mates. So for that cheetah, the fact that his, let's just say it's a he, let's say that his, his fur is not exactly like every other cheetah, doesn't mean that he's any less capable at surviving. So his, that random mutation has no impact on him, nothing positive, nothing negative he's still able to catch his prey and attract his mates. Um, however, the other example here, this alligator that is now albino, you've got some, some green patches, but this alligator is now mainly albino. So that albino alligator is now not nearly as effective at blending in with his environment, okay? He's not able to sneak up on his prey like he would. Um, so that mutation that makes his, his skin albino predominantly um, does have the potential to negatively impact him because now he's not able to acquire food as easily. And if he's not able to blend in and acquire food as easily, then he may not survive. And if he doesn't survive, then he's less likely to reproduce. So the cheetah, that's a great example of a, of a neutral or no impact mutation. Then we've got the alligator here, the albino alligator. That's an example of something that could be negative, that could be potentially detrimental. But even with the albino mutation, it's important to remember that that maybe he's really good at finding his prey, even though he doesn't blend in. So he may still possibly survive and reproduce just as well as any other alligator. So just because it may appear to be detrimental doesn't always mean that it is. All right. Natural selection is based on Darwin's principle that individuals with advantageous characteristics will survive and reproduce in higher numbers than those that don't possess those features, okay? So we call that reproductive success. So individual success, how good is that individual at surviving, acquiring food, acquiring mates? Reproductive success, just like it sounds, essentially, how many offspring are they contributing to the gene pool, essentially? How many genes are they passing along to that gene pool? Okay, so you've seen this slide before, just to kind of remind you of that definition of natural selection. All right, so there are steps or postulates, you may call them, steps of natural selection. So these are basically things that are going to help us understand the process of how natural selection works, okay? And then I'll give you some examples here in a moment. Um, number one, within a population of a species, more individuals are produced than can possibly survive. Now, of course, this is a difficult thing to think about, of course, especially when we're talking about humans. Uh, the reality that more individuals are produced than could possibly survive. Uh, so this reminds me of when we were talking about Thomas Malthus and the idea of supply and demand and the idea of a carrying capacity. You know, every environment essentially has a carrying capacity. And once we've exceeded that carrying capacity, that's when individuals start to die off or that's when individuals start to compete with one another 
so intensely that not all of them are necessarily going to be able to survive. That's just the, the harsh reality of um, the natural world, essentially. All right, number two, um, each population exhibits a great deal of variation. Some individuals will naturally be better adapted to the environment than others, okay? And that's impacted by the genes that they have within their DNA, okay? And sometimes also influenced, of course, by the environment and influenced by behavior. Um, but even if we're just looking strictly at those traits that are genetic, uh, there will be genetic variability within a breeding population. And simply, some individuals will possess the genes that code for beneficial traits, and some will not. Okay. Number three, members of a population will inevitably compete for limited resources. Okay. So again, that idea of supply and demand, that example that I gave you guys earlier on in the semester, if I were to bring in, this were an in-person class and I were to bring in a huge bag of candy bars and there was a bunch of Butterfingers, a bunch of Snickers, a bunch of Milky Ways, a bunch of Almond Joys, a bunch of Malms, a bunch of M&Ms. You guys get the picture. There's a huge variety of every single different candy you could think of. Chances are you're all going to be happy. You're all going to find something that you like to eat. But if I brought in even the same amount of candy, but I brought in only Butterfingers or only Snickers, then chances are at least one of you may not like Snickers or maybe you have a peanut allergy and you can't eat Snickers. Um, so if there's unlimited resources or in, in you know environments where there's a plethora of resources, um, that's when individuals tend to thrive and increase in, in, in numbers. But when there's um, a limited amount of resources or say maybe there's an environmental event, some sort of drought or famine um, or an, an environmental catastrophe that all of a sudden removes a, um, a section of resources or a certain type of resource, then all of a sudden some of those individuals that were maybe reliant upon seeds, for example, if those seeds are no longer available, then either they have to switch resources or they have to, or they're going to die out. But when they switch resources, they may then be competing with whoever else was reliant upon those resources. So, you know, that's when you see, you know, when there's competition for limited resources, that's also when you start to see individuals die out in the population. All right, number four, those individuals that are best adapted to their environment will have the highest level of reproductive success. So hopefully this one just kind of common sense at this point. If your you know, individual success and reproductive success are related, if you're better at surviving yourself, then even just simply by chance, if you have a higher likelihood of survival, then it's also going to be more likely that you survive into your reproductive years and also more likely that you have more surviving offspring. If you have a higher access to resources, and you can also um, provide those resources to your offspring to help them survive. All right, number five, if populations of species become reproductively isolated from one another, speciation events or the formation of new species, genetically distinct species, may occur over many generations. Okay, so that's kind of that reproductive isolation example I gave you guys at the very beginning of today's lecture. All right, natural selection will require that traits have two factors. They must be variable. So you'll probably get sick of hearing me say that. You'll get sick of hearing me say this, but in the game of evolution, diversity will always win. So genetic variability, genetic variation is always going to be a good thing because if all of the organisms in a given population are identical, or at least if they have a shallow gene pool is another way of, of thinking of it. If they don't have a whole lot of genetic variation, then once the environment shifts, even if it's a slight shift, or if there's an environmental catastrophe, worst case scenario, um, if those individuals don't have genetic variability, they may not survive. Um, and then traits must be heritable, at least those that we measure by natural selection. So the traits must be inherited through genes passed by the parents, rather than acquired in the individual's lifetime or influenced by the environment. Okay, now, of course, we always look at the influence of the environment, but if we're measuring, if we're measuring inheritability, we're just simply looking at these two factors. All right, so let's look at some examples. All right, so we already looked at the rock pocket mouse, but what I really want to show you guys today to make sure you're prepared for your um, online discussion is I wanna give you an example of natural selection in humans. I'm gonna skip forward a couple slides because I wanna, I really wanna get to this example today. Um, we'll talk about the peppered moth next week. 
but I want to talk about sickle cell anemia and malaria. Okay, because this is a really beautiful example of natural selection and mutation in humans. So those of you that don't know, sickle cell is, um, it's a, a disorder that affects your hemoglobin, your blood. So your red blood cells become kind of sickle shaped. I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. So they become kind of sickle shaped instead of this nice round shape that you see in a normal red blood cell. So these sickle shaped cells, you see pictures of them here, uh, they're more likely to clump and clot as they pass through your body, trying to you know trying to bring oxygen to your organs. Red blood cells are mainly responsible for bringing oxygen to your organs. So those that have sickle cell anemia in the homozygous recessive form um, become very they they suffer things like organ failure when they become hypoxic when they have trouble getting oxygen to all their organs. Okay, so those that have sickle cell anemia in the homozygous recessive form the SS genotype, um, suffer from the sickle cell anemia crisis. It's an illness that is usually fatal without medical intervention. So oftentimes those with the, the full-on homozygous SS genotype that have sickle cell anemia and do not have access to medical care um, generally end up dying before reproductive years, unfortunately. Okay, but what, um, what scientists have found is that heterozygote individuals, so those that inherit a dominant allele from one parent and a mutated S allele from another do not suffer from the sickling crisis of the homozygous recessive individuals. However, they do possess a somewhat lower oxygen level in their hemoglobin, which is where the malarial parasite will finish its life cycle. So essentially those that are heterozygous, we call this the heterozygote advantage, those that are heterozygous with the AS genotype they don't have the negative impact of sickle cell anemia because their oxygen levels are not low enough for it to impact them drastically. Uh, but their oxygen levels are low enough in the hemoglobin that will impact the malarial parasite. So if you're a human that lives in a region where malaria is endemic, like sub-Saharan Africa, um, southern parts of Europe, um, the Middle East, uh, southern India, any region where malaria is endemic. And, you know, us in the U.S., we're not necessarily, um, you know, we're not out of the woods on that one because we have a lot more situations where mosquitoes are becoming a more major issue. So um, any region where malaria is a problem, um, being the heterozygote form would be an advantage, okay? Because you don't have the sickling crisis yourself, but if you happen to get bitten by a mosquito that's carrying malaria, um, you know, of course you're still gonna get bitten by that mosquito and malaria is still gonna try to take over your body but it's not going to be successful at it because you have that, you know, slightly lower oxygen level in your hemoglobin, which prevents the malarial parasite from finishing its life cycle. All right. So the fascinating thing about this, 20 to 30 percent of people living in equatorial Africa have this S gene, um, whether it's in the heterozygote form or the homozygous recessive. And really, it's not just in equatorial Africa. It's also in India, also in parts of the Middle East, also in parts of southern Europe. Just basically any region where malaria is endemic, we see a higher frequency of the S gene overlapping in those regions. Okay, so you can actually put a map. I mean, this is focusing on Africa mainly, but um, this is where the studies were first done. But just so you know, it's not just Africa, it's just any region where malaria is endemic. So you see there is a correlation. You can almost, you know, superimpose these maps right on top of each other. There is a correlation of malaria happening you know, this is the areas where malaria is present in the red. And then over here, you see the more malaria is present, the higher the incidence of the S gene, the S mutated gene. Okay, so I don't want to get too much away because I do want you guys to watch this little clip together so we can talk about it. Um, this one is going to, this is also the same video clip that you're going to be watching for your discussion this week. So you're going to be killing two birds with one stone if you take some notes as you as you watch this little documentary right here, it's only about 14 minutes. Um, so let's go ahead and watch it. Let me just make sure that I maximized for sound. Perfect. All right, so as you're watching, you know, definitely jot down some notes. Um, you know, don't, don't, um, don't feel like you have to write down every detail, but I definitely want you to write down, focus in on the action of mutation and natural selection and how it's an example of mutation and natural selection in humans, okay? And then the second thing I want you to focus on is why malaria, or excuse me, why sickle cell 
is not considered a racial trait, okay? Because that's been a, a misconception and a stereotype that's been, you know, that's been present. So think about why this video is an example of how sickle cell is not a racial trait. Okay, let's go ahead and watch it, then we'll talk about it. Devon, Devon and Sky Cooper are brother and sister. Both of them have sickle cell anemia. Before the advent of modern medicine, sickle cell anemia almost certainly meant death before adulthood. Even today, young patients can suffer strokes and organ failure. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease. Parents of those who have the disease might not have it themselves, but both must carry the sickle cell character in their DNA. So how's it going? Good, can I see your hands? This is pretty, where'd that come from? Was that from Brooklyn? Besides some bone pain, wow. Skye leads the fairly normal life of a 13-year-old girl. But her younger brother, Devon, has suffered acute chest syndrome and has already had his spleen removed. So you don't get any more belly pains? That's good. Skye and Devon's symptoms arise from the fact that some of their red blood cells become misshapen crescents instead of discs, preventing enough oxygen from being delivered to all parts of the body. It's not completely clear why symptoms are variable, but what is most perplexing about sickle cell disease is that it's not rare. So in the United States, we think there are between 70 and 125,000 persons with sickle cell disease. Um, however, that doesn't take into account immigration and other uh, patients or persons coming from other parts of the world into the country. In fact, in some populations, African Americans, for example, the incidence is as high as one in 500, astoundingly high for a deadly inherited disease. Didn't Darwin teach us that harmful traits disappear from the gene pool through natural selection? Why is sickle cell anemia so prevalent? And why in particular among people of African descent? The answers to these questions began with a remarkable set of observations from an unlikely person more than 60 years ago. Tony Allison has spent most of his career as a medical doctor and molecular biologist in the U.S. and England. But he grew up in East Africa, and he's quick to recall his formative years in Kenya. The point is that we lived in, in the upcountry, and we used to go to the coast every year in August for the holiday when it was a little bit cooler than at other times. So we had the trip all the way down, which was usually with a truck and a car. And uh, so we would camp on the way and in Tavo, and there would be lions roaring around, so it was really quite exciting. These are the infamous Tavo lions. The famous right. infamous Tavo lions. Around 1950, biologists didn't know a lot about the details of evolution because we didn't know really how heredity worked. The structure of DNA had not been discovered yet. Genetic code had not been cracked. So we know that while evolution was due to genetic changes, uh, we didn't know how those genetic changes took place whatsoever. So there were holes in the whole picture of the evolutionary process. And Tony Allison was probably the least likely person that you would imagine who would fill one of the most critical holes. He grew up far away from the centers of science in Europe and North America. He was really interested in natural history and he loved the Kenyan wildlife and he visited archaeological digs that were going on at the time. But it was a really circuitous and serendipitous route that led him to an enormous discovery in evolutionary biology. Tony first went to university in South Africa where he studied physical anthropology then to medical school at Oxford. He had a deep interest in human origins but not so much in ancient stones and bones. Tony was interested in blood. Could the common ABO blood type say anything about the evolutionary history of East African tribal people? And I actually learned just before going out about the sickle cell condition. And nobody really knew the frequencies of sickle cells in East Africa, so it was a, a barren slate, so to speak. Blood samples from people carrying the sickle cell character appear quite normal until oxygen is removed. Tony learned that adding a chemical agent to the samples would quickly reduce oxygen 
and reveal sickle cells, if they were there. This gave him an easy test to score blood samples for the sickle cell character. What was striking was that you had high frequencies of people carrying the sickle cell character right. in the coast and near Lake Victoria, and very low frequencies in the high country in between in Nairobi. What could possibly account for such a striking disparity? The sickle cell character was understood to be genetic, not environmental. Tony had grown up in the dry Kenyan highlands, but he knew the warm, moist lowlands were a breeding ground for the Anopheles mosquito that carried the malaria parasite, Plasmodium falciparum. And it dawned on him, the places where there was a really high incidence of sickle cell was where there was a really high incidence of malaria. Bang. Now it was a burning question that confronted Tony. Could sickle cell and malaria be connected? And if so, how? It was a radical notion that a genetic disease could somehow be connected to an infection. When you went back to Oxford, you had this idea of a linkage between right. sickle cell and malaria, but you hadn't published it. Did you know it was a big deal? I mean, did you, I did you think? I was sure it was a big sure deal. It was a big deal. Yes. So you were, but, but that's why, that's why I wanted not to yeah. go off half cocked. Yeah. I wanted to have a really complete story. So he decided he had to sit on this idea until he got a chance to test it properly. So and a key element of the scientific method is to come up with a hypothesis, that's great, but you've got to test it in every way possible to see whether or not it can hold up to that sort of scrutiny. That's how science moves forward. Well, the scientific method essentially means that you address a problem and try to find a solution. And so you look at children of the appropriate age and find out whether they are in fact protected against malaria. And if that's the case, you predict that you will have high frequencies of sickle cells only in areas where malaria is endemic. You wanted to know that this, this correlation held not just in Kenya, but everywhere. It would be important to look directly at the incidence of malaria and sickle cell in as many areas as possible. So, Tony went on a sickle cell safari. He wanted to gather blood samples from all over East Africa to really test this correlation. And now he was a trained medical doc, so he had something to offer. So he would go into the market on market day and offer to do checkups on children and just take a little finger prick or a little heel prick to get a little sample of blood. The first thing he did was look at the malaria parasite load in each sample. Then he tested for the sickle cell character. He found that children carrying the character had a lower parasite count as if they were partially protected against malaria. And when he examined the blood of about 5,000 individuals, a really massive study, the correlation was really clear. So clear, in fact, that he could really draw a map of East Africa and shade in the areas of high incidence of sickle cell, and they were superimposed right on top of the areas of high incidence of malaria. Bang, that was it. The many samples and detailed maps made it clear there was a connection between sickle cell and malaria. But to understand how sickle cell might protect people from malaria required thinking about the genetics of sickle cell. What happens is the genes are lined up on chromosomes and one has pairs of them with the exception of the sex chromosomes. And this means that you have two copies. So the copies can be the same or they can be different. And if they're the same, they're called homozygous. And if they're different, they're called heterozygous. When an individual finds a partner and reproduces, one of each pair of chromosomes is passed on. If the parents are both heterozygous, carrying one sickle cell and one normal gene, odds are one in four that the child will be sickle cell homozygous, two in four that the child will be heterozygous, and one in four that the child will carry two copies of the normal gene. In the absence of malaria, there is strong selection against the sickle cell gene. However, in a malarial environment, individuals born with two copies of the sickle cell gene and those born with two copies of the normal gene are both at a disadvantage. One gets sickle cell disease 
the other is most vulnerable to malaria. Tony's brilliant insight was that those that carried just one sickle cell gene had an innate resistance to malaria. Malaria tipped the selective balance in favor of heterozygotes. The evolutionary trade-off is that protection from malaria comes at the cost of more sickle cell disease in the population. The sickle cell mutation was not the best genetic solution you might imagine to resist malaria. That's not how evolution works. It was the most available. A simple typo, A to T, in the gene that encodes hemoglobin. Mistakes are made in the copying of DNA in every generation. You and I were born with about 40 or 50 mutations that didn't exist in either of our parents. It's just part of the nature of copying three billion letters in the, in the process of reproduction. Uh, and when those mistakes arise, a typo arises in the globin gene. For most of us, that would be a bad thing. But if you live in a malarial area, it gives you an edge against the malarial parasite. So that mutation is retained. Well, fitness essentially is a measure of whether a particular gene is likely to be passed on to the next generation. And this means that for that to happen, the individual carrying that gene has to survive to reproductive age, and secondly, has to reproduce. Now you had a sense that you had this explanation that was general to, yep. to the prevalence of sickle cell and its, and its uh, correlation with malaria, but you didn't quite know the mechanism, right? So That's right. what did you do next? Well, uh, <laughs> I have to say, I, I left that part of the story to others because uh, it's quite a complex story, I mean. A large body of subsequent research has shown that the sickle cell mutation compromises the ability of the parasite to reproduce. Thus, a mutation that creates one genetic disease can also protect against another disease. What Tony gave us was a fully worked out example of evolution by natural selection. And the amazing thing was this was in humans. This is how natural selection was working on humans in real time, in the real world. Tony's map of East Africa was a stunning achievement, but he could go further than that. He knew that there was a high incidence of sickle cell in Southern Europe, in Southern India, and in other parts of Africa. And it turns out these were all malarial zones as well. And so his map applied not just to East Africa, but that whole part of the world. What I'm explaining about the origins of sickle cell disease and its association with malaria to children or their families, they often look at me with incredulity. They don't understand. Like, you're kidding, right? This is all to do with a mosquito infection. As our species has been able to move across the globe to areas with low malarial incidence, this gene is now really more of a nuisance than anything else. It's not really a clear selective advantage for them in Boston, let's say. Um, but it takes thousands of years for the population to change and for genetics to change based on the pressures around them in the environment. What Tony Allison did, first with his sharp intuition and then with his rigorous research, will stand as a monument, bringing our own evolutionary process into the light. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording because what